Right, oh, Sugar and Princess next. Load them up. Ridgeways are on the move again. They've been on the road for over 140 years, starting originally in Australia and travelling that country and this more times than they can count. New Zealand saw its first circus in 1855, and we've been seeing circus entertainment ever since, frequently the Ridgeways. It's an honourable life, the circus, but it's never been an easy one. Uh, I remember my father, this is a long time ago, he had 72 horses and we used to pull pull our wagons from uh, town to town, when I say from town to town, that uh, you had to drive them from town to town. I used to drive the tail of the horses, what they call tail of the horses. I used to leave before the others did, and that. And I never forget my old man, he had a, a donkey, and they called him Banana. He hated me and I hated him, the donkey, and that, that's just true, I'm not telling you what I was like, and that, and because uh, I used to take off with these horses, tail them, when I say tail them, I used to ride one, I had to drive all all the others in front. Well, I used to leave of the night times, well, it was, it was actually in the morning, I used to leave when it was dark, and I'd get into the town the next day when it was dark. I'd get there just in time for the circus to start again. And that's, uh, that's how we kept going, you know? Charlie's wife, Pat, was a dancer at the Tivoli Theatre in Australia when they married in 1943, and she became part of the Ridgeway family. Well, when we were first married, we lived in a little 6 by 8 tent on a little stretcher. That was our bed, and we had a little butter box with a candle on it. We lived out of a suitcase, which was stuck underneath the, the bed. It was very basic, and I suppose you'd have to have a very good sense of humour to survive it. But uh, now, I suppose, like nobody lives like that now. People think you do, but they don't. Like everyone's got more or less more modern, caravans, everyone's got their own cars and their own transport. Not like it was then. I worked with uh, Charlie as a, we'd done a horse act, we'd done a balancing act. And of course, no matter what it was, you went in and tried. Uh, even if it was something you'd never done before, you were expected to go in and do it, you know. Uh, as strange as it may seem, I was very frightened of heights. And uh, we were doing a balancing act, and we were doing it for the boys' town out in the open, in which Charlie used to balance the ladder on his feet. And I used to go up and work on the ladder. And uh, we were out in the open, and of course the clouds were going across, and he was sort of watching the top of the ladder, which made it very awkward with the clouds. And I fell, and I broke both my feet. Well, then, when it came to the time to get back into the act again, after my feet had healed, I found it very difficult. We were to open in Melbourne at the Tivoli Theatre there, and uh, they said, well, you better have a practice before you go on. I said, oh, no, I'll be right. I'd rather go and work straight in front of the audience. Well, with the result that they put me on the lad, and they said, no, go on, hug. up you go for practice. And I got up, and I sat on the top of the ladder, and I couldn't move, and I was just petrified. I, I, I said, I'll never come down. And I was just sitting there, and Charlie had a way of, he used to just kick his knees underneath you like that, and it used to feel like you were falling, and he just kept doing it and saying, come on, come down. And then what are we going to do tomorrow? It doesn't look like your work and all this business, you know. But uh, in the end, I came down, but it was a terrible, frightening experience for, you know. But after that, I was all right. It's not an easy life. It never has been and never will be. And unless you love your animals and love what you're doing, I don't think you'd ever really survive it. And I'm only just happy now that both my sons uh, have the same feeling, like they've joined, the, you know, that, that real feeling of circus tradition. And of course, that gives me great, great satisfaction. My sons, Charlie Ridgway Jr. and Carrie Ridgway, knew the rigors of a circus very well. It still occupies their whole horizon and their total activity, loading articulated trucks, working with wild animals, and the fun, 
making people laugh twice a day. Charlie Jr. is the one with the pony. On him sits an unspoken responsibility, the eldest son in a famous family tradition. I first joined the circus when I was six weeks old. <laughs> Uh, my father was over here on New Zealand touring and they, Australia, the circus came from Australia and my mother stayed there, she had me and then six weeks later we came, I believe we came out in a flying boat and landed there and the circus was showing a place called Tiara uh, down It's the still there. It's still there, I know I've been there <laughs> quite a bit. Actually I nearly, I nearly stayed there once. <laughs> uh, I got caught by one of the lionesses there uh, back in 71. And it, it was a, it's a place I joined the circus, I nearly left the circus there, you know. You stay with the show. It's, um, you mix with your own people. A lot of it is too that um, you grow up with adults, so therefore your ideas become older a lot quicker. You sort of look at things in a different way. It's August, and the Ridgeways have taken up a contract with the Kerrang Happy Road Businessmen's Association to entertain children for two weeks. Their destination, an asphalt car park in Auckland's inner city. Not ideal for animals and setting up a big top, but the family will adapt, just as they do every week of the year. I'm 60, 67 years of age, and uh, I've been at all my life, all my life, born in the circus, and uh, I know I've been putting up a lot of tents, big ones, little ones, small ones, and they're all the same, whether you put up a, uh, a little tent or you put up a great big Ringley Brothers tent, they all go up the same, they all come down the same. Like Do they that. always go up smoothly? Uh, no, not really, no, on fine days they go up uh, reasonably all right, but if you've got a heavy wind blowing, that's, uh, that's an headache then, like, you know, you're worrying about, uh, like, you've got a lot of things you've got to worry about, like, uh, like these big steel poles jumping out and hitting someone on that. I have seen three blokes killed with a circus, like, like years ago they never used to use steel king poles and quarter poles and wind poles, it was all big Oregon poles and that, and I've seen one king pole, it's a nice big Oregon bloke, snap right off and go right through a bloke, drive just like hitting him on the head with a, a stake and go right through him, kill him stone dead there and there and then on the spot. To replace this tent today, that's just the, the top part, that's without the poles or sidewalls or guys or anything like that, would cost you between thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. We, we've had uh, sections blown out of our tents and uh, uh, many, many years ago, it was a lot smaller tent than this, we did, we did lose it, but the guy rope snapped and it, it blew what we call blow over, it just went sailing through the air. Uh, Ashton's and they were touring New Zealand, I, I knew one, they were showing a place called Manaya around the Taranaki, and uh, it was blowing that hard, the tent was moving, rocking about that much, that the flying trapeze, which actually hangs from the top of the tent, was bouncing around that much, the flyers couldn't catch the tricks. <laughs> so, tent up, ready to show? Well, it will be by tea time tonight, yeah. <laughs> Carey is the mechanical one. He'll perform in the ring later, but more of his life is spent in overalls than spangles. 
the ridgeways have to be completely self-reliant. Manpower sets up the tent, but electric power is usually generated from their own travelling plant. Children of all ages are waiting in an excited queue for the day's first performance. They'll see 67-year-old Charlie Ridgway Sr. in his role of ringmaster. But behind the scenes, he's also patriarch and chief of staff. He also seldom forgets who he's met. Now this is a special program put on specially for the children while the school holidays are on and it's put on by the Businessmen's Association of k -Rab. Now also, they are raising funds to try and build the new children's hospital which they're building here in Auckland. Now before we start the circus program off today, ladies and gentlemen, we're in today, we've got a celebrity, a well-known figure in the television and radio business, Mr. Max Cryer. Stand up, Mr. Max, would you? Stand up, thank you. Max Cryer. I might say, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, 15 or 16 years ago, we were shown at Tiamuda, and Mr. Max Cryer come around the circus, and I said, now look, if we could get that bloke there, I said he's like a terrific clown. <laughs> now we open up this morning's program with Ridgeway Brothers performing in African Lines, trained and introduced by Charles Ridgeway Jr. Charlie Ridgway Jr. is rated as one of the best wild animal handlers in the Southern Hemisphere. Traditionally, the Lion Act always opens the circus. For centuries, animals have been brought in from the wild to entertain man, or sometimes to kill him. Battles between gladiators and lions were a great feat of strength, while members of rebel religions were often disposed of by tossing them into the ring to a bloodied slaughter. Nowadays, every circus has to have lions. They aren't expensive, they're simple to feed, and they breed freely. Biologically, they're classified as roaring cats, as opposed to those cats which purr. Up until the 19th century, lions in captivity were just for looking at. And then in 1801 is the first case on record of a lion tamer going into a cage and showing them off as animals under his control. This was the turning point, and the honoured profession of lion tamer was born. In a circus, the magnificent grace of a lion in movement is put on show in a way which visitors to a zoo wouldn't see. The lion tamer treads a difficult path. He proves mastery and skill by presenting these animals as obedient. But their wild character is allowed to be revealed just enough to remind the spectators of the risks they're watching him take. We see lions all the time, on TV, in magazines, in advertising and at the movies, but at a safe distance. It takes great courage for a human to step into a cage with these animals. Charlie Ridgway does it several times a day. I've had lions chase me around the cage. I've got a cane or a whip and you sort of hit them over the head and I've these stools and that. I've, I've picked up stools and thrown stools at them to try and make them go back in their seats. And it sounds silly, but I wasn't really frightened because I never had time to be frightened. But when the lions were put away and I went back outside that cage, I, <laughs> I was frightened, right? You've got to respect them. If they're a, a ferocious animal, they've all got their claws, they've all got their teeth, and you know, some of them weigh six and seven hundred pounds of weight. Like, uh, if they want to really have you, they could have you. Yeah. I'm not no more cheating! If you cheat this time, I'll smack you on the rear end. Right, hey, 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 come on over! Hey! hey. <laughs> 
Besides courage, a lion tamer has to be enough of an actor to make the performance exciting and encourage the lion's slightest movement into a moment of ferocious power, of which everyone knows they're capable, so the audience gets their thrill. But part of the purpose of a good lion tamer's act is also to display the beauty and the agility of the animal. Charlie's younger brother, Carrie, is 27. He's travelled and worked with the circus all his life. Like his brother, he was schooled through the correspondence system. He can do virtually anything in a circus which has to be done. And all of it, including rope spinning, is learned through doing. In Carrie's case, learning from his father, who learned from his father. Already today, Carrie has helped feed the animals, check the big top, prepared the advertising, maintained the generator, tested the rigging, ordered next week's hay, and gone with his brother to negotiate the circus's next series of appearances. There's still his work-cracking act, the clown suit and comedy ladder routine to come, and it isn't even midday yet. In the afternoon, the whole routine will keep going, as it will for everyone in the family. carries in the ring, Charlie Jr. has just three minutes to change before his next act. There must be an easier way to make a living. <laughs> I suppose there would be, but uh, when you're sort of born in it and been in it all your life, you don't know much else, it's uh, about the only way you can uh, earn a dollar. It's not easy like a lot of people think it is. It's a lot of hard work sometimes and, and that, but uh, if there was no circus, there'd only be the uh, pick and shovel for me. Sounds like I'm running a bit late, too. Hey? Well, I'll have to be off. I'll see you after.
All circuses use these little sketches to bridge between one act and the next. They're called clown entrees. This particular routine is over 100 years old and is received with as much warmth today as it ever was. And two dangers, and you're liable to hit someone. You can't fire that from the ring, neither. It's still too big. Still too big. Still too big. Ain't no problem, because I always carry a spear with me. I say! What's that? I'm going to bounce right off that man's head. <laughs> I'm going to turn him into a punk rocker. <laughs> I say! He might want to be a punk rocker. That's still too big. Still too big. Still too big. <laughs> What's that? What's that? I'm going to try to right up his trousers. He's going to break this. Now listen here. I'm not going to tell you no more. No more. You can't throw a big boomerang. I can't throw a big boomerang. You can't throw a small boomerang. I can't throw a small boomerang. You can't throw no boomerang inside this tent. Well, how am I going to show all the girls and boys how to catch the kangaroo? I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. What will you do? Oh, so many hats. You have no comeback. I have comeback because look out. <laughs> well, that's it here now. Australia's champion, Whipcracker, Terry Ridgway. <laughs> One and a half minutes later, and Carrie is back in the ring with his whip cracking routine. His partner is Kathy, who fills the traditional role of attractive support to the act. She's new to circus life, but responds well to all its demands. I started doing the whips actually in the show in 67. Uh, so after a number of years, it becomes more it's like a reflex more than anything else. And you can go in, you know your routine, and virtually um, your body just takes over. It just sort of depends. Sometimes you might be feeling a little bit better than others, and things go a little bit better. But basically, it's just a, a matter of um, as soon as you walk through the door, everything just switches on, and that's the way it goes. You know? It was something that I really picked up from my father. He basically showed me the um, fundamentals. And from there on, I, I learned basically by watching him, uh, trial and error, shall we say, a few little scratches here and there. Yeah. But um, it's one of those things that you just sort of pick up as you go along. It takes a lot of time and effort to get into it. Yeah. a few fancy cracks with a one-stock weapon, what they call the different cracks. The first crack you'll demonstrate is what they call the Sydney Flash. And now I'll show you what they call the Bushman's flash. And now I'll demonstrate the hardest crack you can do with a stock whip is what they call chain lightning. Now to do this, he's got to work the whip in front of him, and the whip's got to crack four times with every four of the whip. And now you're going to show you what the same do on the movies, not the television. When the same gets someone a flower with a stock whip, he's going to show you now. Now you can get flour with a stock whip, and that's good enough. And now you are going to prove by showing you the hardest thing you can do with a stock whip, that's cut anything out of anybody's mouth. He's going to show you now. Now he can cut a cigarette out of the young chimp's mouth. Now to do this, he's going to get very close to the boy's face. And I won't show you a stock whip, and he'll be as deadly as a gun. A cigarette out of the mouth with a stock whip. Three, two, one. Now you're going to show you what the same do on the movies, not the television. When you see him get someone a flower with a stock whip, he's going to show you now. Do you think you could ever go back to an ordinary, um, to what's called an ordinary life? No, I don't think so. Now I've really adjusted to this, and I I think it would be harder to go back 
to what I thought was, you know, the norm, the everyday life. I really don't think I would be able to do that. It's harder again. to leave for them it to is, join. It is, it is. Do you agree, Harry? Yeah. Because you were born into the family. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this is the thing. I, I find it very, uh, very difficult now to live in a, a house or in that sort of situation. I don't really think that I could sort of work in a nine-to-five job something like that. I get very bored. Kathy calls me a, uh, a workaholic. I get uh, very bored if I've got spare time on my hands. I'm so used to being on the go all day, every day, virtually, that I Sometimes can't really... Things to do. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I just can't sort of relax. You two both have said that everybody does everything in the circus, but mm. there does in performance to be there does seem to be a certain division of responsibility. You carry, do um, skillful things with stock whip mm. and with ropes, right. but not with animals. Well, it's one of those sort of things. Um, a lot of it depends. You see, when you work, you run a, uh, when you work your run of the show out. Uh, it all depends basically on who's where. As far as like the uh, major stock acts. Charlie, he works the lions and the elephants, and that's his virtually. But as far as the horses and the dogs and that yeah. sort of side of it, it really um, it's a matter available. of who's available. Yeah, at that while time. one's getting changed, one works the animals. When you're uh, when you're in this sort of business, you tend to be able to do a lot of different things. If anyone sort of gets hurt or anything like that, you can virtually go in and work for them. Actually, last. It'd be about 18 months ago now, Charlie, he was the catcher in the flying act and he cracked his kneecap and uh, I was catching in place of for uh, a few days until he could get a, a new catcher over. Circus doesn't end when the performance ends. What happens out in front of the public is the highlight of the working day. But here out the back, the working day never ends. And one of the most constant factors of that work is the endless cleaning up. Hey, Mark, will you put some more sawdust in the ring? Craig, you do the chimps, will you? I was looking for a job for about a week, and then I was just coming home in the bus one night, and after a job application, and I saw the circus at Western Springs and I just uh, rolled in and asked if, I'd, asked if they wanted somebody to work there. Did you have a reason? Was there sort of a, a fantasy inside you about a circus? No, not really. It's just, uh, I just saw it there and I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe there's a job there. And I got off the bus and walked up and asked and I started the next day. It was just, just like that. We've all heard about people joining the circus. Did it turn out to be the way that you imagined a circus was? Uh, it's different in some respects, but you know... <laughs> <laughs> Tell us some of the respects it's different. Well, uh, it's very demanding. Um, you've got to be there seven days a week, uh, for starters, and um, it's, there's a set routine virtually each week that you've got to do, you know, putting the tent up and get everything ready for the show and putting the tent down afterwards, feeding the animals every day. Uh, you know, there's procedures that, that you've got to do each do you, day. Do you have a lot of contact with the animals? Yes, oh, yeah, quite a bit. Uh, you get to know them all by name virtually, you know, and uh, you're feeding them every day and you get to know their nature and their characteristics. This isn't just a circus. When space permits, the Ridgeways open up the trucking and display their own travelling zoo. The lions are a major responsibility, a responsibility which Charlie Ridgeway Jr. makes his own. Having moved into his father's former area as chief animal trainer. I first started training a fox terrier dog when I was about 10 years of age. I went up to a Shetland pony. And when I was about, uh, I think I just turned 15, uh, actually my father, he developed a heart condition, which was he used to train the lions. And uh, we had another bloke with the show who used to work the lions in them days because my father couldn't work them. And uh, he got to the attitude, he just sort of left. He, well, he wanted more wages or something. I can't quite remember what it really was, but he left. And uh, I knew all the positions of the lions. I used to look after them, I used to feed them, and I said, I'll work them. At 15? At 15. I was the youngest uh, in Australasia. I was the youngest ever to work lions. Have you had any bad moments with them? I've been caught twice over a period of 20-odd uh, years. So uh, last time I was caught was in 71. But I've been lucky, yeah, I've been worse while well, I was about 30 some stitches had to put in me, you know, but that's, I've been very lucky. Is there any danger that you could relax and just take it for granted or are you always alert? You've got to always be alert, you've got to sort of, uh, when you're working in front of the public, you've got to sort of have the attitude that, uh, well, you're not frightened, I'll put it that way, you know what I mean? You've got to sort of present them as a line act and 
and make them sing out and make them do it. But uh, you got to sort of just, well, that comes with professionalism, I suppose. It's, uh, and over the period, as I say, 20 years is a long time. You sort of get to know. You've got to sense it, too. You've got to sort of, uh, like I was breaking some lines in once, and when you break them and you have ropes on them, like you have rope, two ropes. One goes back out through the cage and one stays inside the cage, which you have, and they have a couple other people hold them on the outside. So see, they start learning what to do. And I had the rope off this line one day, and I was bringing, used to bring him out and make him sit up. And uh, I'd done it a few times, he was playing up. So I said to the bloke outside, I said, I, said, I think we'd better put a rope on this line. I said, uh, you know, I said, he's getting a bit towy. Uh, and the bloke said, oh, no, what do you want a rope for? He said, well, I said, no, we'll put, a, put the rope on him. And we put the rope on him, and you wouldn't credit. Next time he went to come out, he flew out. And there was a rope, the rope ran through the bloke's hands, but the rope just slowed him up. And I think I would have had a very nasty experience that time if I, but I just sensed something. Something inside me just told me to put a rope on him, you know? I don't know what it was, it's just something that just told me. What would you actually do if a lion escaped or something went wrong in a performance? What, do you have a fail safe, a backup? Uh, well, I wouldn't say uh, we don't really think of it. We don't really take that into consideration. We have, uh, or we look at all security uh, things that the lions can't get out or anything like that. But as far as me getting mauled or anything like that, uh, we don't really, we don't have a gun or anything like that handy. I'll put it that way because uh, having guns, well, you could go to shoot the lion with you in a tent with a cage and people sitting around the gun. The bullet could ricochet off and hit someone in the audience. So you don't. Uh, that's, that's the name of the game, and uh, if you can't work them and you, you can't handle them properly, you shouldn't be in the cage, you know? The circus isn't just here in the ring. It's in our vocabulary as well. Before an election, you hear about a politician walking a tightrope, and a sports coach or a tough employer is often said to put people through the hoops. On a busy day, we speak about juggling three appointments, and a spectacular public function, or a rather chaotic household, is often described as a three-ring circus. It's the same with popular music. The circus and the things around it have given us a hundred images into songs which can summon up this unique atmosphere, sometimes with just a few notes. <laughs> Danny Kay made the Sideshow Alley famous with this one. Kermit the Frog told Miss Piggy that he was in love with Lydia the Tattooed Lady, and for decades every radio session requested Beatrice Kay singing, Don't go in the lion's cage tonight, mother darling. The lions look ferocious and may bite. In the 1960s, the pop bands all sang, Goodbye, cruel world, I'm off to join the circus. Or this. <laughs> Simon Smith and his amazing dancing bear. And there can't be anybody alive who hasn't heard about this daring young man. <laughs> On his flying trapeze, or the eternal creed of the clowns, make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh. Why don't you stand up? Stood up there. Stand right up there. How about you stood up there? Put one foot up there. 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 The success of a well-integrated circus is closely related to its clowns. Especially in a show aimed at a children's audience, you need lots of laughs as well as thrills. Clowns are the key people. They provide the essential comic relief from the tensions inevitably produced by the more dangerous acts. Being a clown can itself be quite dangerous. In this family circus, the Ridgeways perform all the acts but they're also the clowns who create the happiness. All of the Ridgeway children for years have started their circus training in the ring as clowns. This particular revolving ladder act was originated in the 19th century and has been taught to successive generations of Ridgeways, father and son.
elephant is probably the most popular of all the animals in the circus, it's King Pin. It's the costliest to buy, the most difficult to replace, and it can also be the most dangerous. Elephants aren't as slow moving and lumbering as they first appear. Their sense of balance is extraordinarily good, and they can be seen to enjoy audience response like any good performer. All of this can only be achieved when enormous trust exists between the elephant and the trainer. It's a bond which outsiders find difficult to understand, but circus people know is essential. And now we, like we do have an elephant hooked all the time for security reasons, handy. Uh, and sometimes when she's not in a very good mood, I do have a hook on me, elephant hook. But I try not to use a hook or, or whips or anything like that. Like overseas, you see them crack the big stock whip and make the elephant do this. I try and, because uh, I'm trying to let the public know that uh, they're my tools of trade. And uh, the least thing I want to do is to... Uh, will belt the animal. I, I, I try and give them a tip fit when they do good, I try and give them a kind word, I try to talk to them, and uh, I get pretty good response. They mightn't do as flash as tricks as some of the elephants you see on television overseas or something like that, but I don't think the public want to see, if they want to see, if they go see a, come and see an animal where it's, uh, it's threatened all the time and browbeated all the time to do fantastic tricks, I don't think the people like that as much has seen an animal enjoy itself, an animal come out and virtually do the tricks of its own accord. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're going to show you how dirty a three and a half ton elephant can be with Toshima. We're going to lay our assistant down and she's going to step over top of them without even hurting them. And now we're going to lay two down and she Fittingly for a star, Sheba's appearance marks the end of another Ridgeway Circus performance. And now we're going to lay three down and she'll step over three. Step over five. Now this will be a big strike for a three and a half ton elephant. You have to reach out a long way for this one here. There she goes. There she goes. Yeah. Thank you. Now. Thank you, Sheba, our three-and-a-half-ton Indian elephant. Thank you, Sheba. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that concludes the morning session. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you've enjoyed it, kindly tell your friends. We well, thank you for coming, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have you been watching the show today? A uh, little bit in between times. Uh, in between what? <laughs> making candy floss and hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it always candy floss and hot dogs? I think it's traditional. Uh, it's like when people go to a fair, they want to see hot dogs, candy floss. You know, it's one of those things I like to eat. And sometimes popcorn. Popcorn, yes. Do you wish you were back in the ring? Sometimes, yes. It's, you must miss it. I do, yes. H how many years were you actually out there? Well, I don't know, but I suppose I've been out of the ring now about 10 years. So it's a good 30 years. But you're not far away with the candy floss? No, I'm not far away, but I do miss it. You hear a music come on, you know, and you think, oh, I'd love to be in there working. Or you see somebody else working, and you think, I'd love to be doing that, you know. Or this is the way I do it, or that's the way they do it, you know. There's a difference. Could you ever leave the whole thing? Like, if you... If you do retire, or if you reach the age where people say they're going to retire, what will you do? I don't think I could. I really don't think I could. It's just one of those things. I think I'll be like the cowboys die with my spangles on. <laughs> well, I think there always will be a circus, and circus is always for me because it's, it's the only life I know. Whether I'm safe, I'm secure in it. As I say, I know it pretty well backwards. It's, a, it's not a very good life. It's not a very glamorous life. A lot of people think it's very glamorous and, you know, you just go there with all the sawdust and the spangles and the lights and 
doesn't look you know, you're out in the mud and the slush a hell of a lot, you know, but it's a good life and it's an outdoor life. You see a lot of the world. You see a lot of uh, walk, different walks of life. And it's just uh, one of those things. And if there'll always be a circus, as a matter of pride, you'd always like to be a Ridgeway circus as well. Oh, well, that's true. Like when my great great grandfather started the circus, you know, and it's been running around New Zealand and Australia for a long, long time. And uh, you, you, get, you get a little warm glow on your inside sometimes when, when you're up the street or if you're somewhere and someone comes up and says, hey, I've seen the circus you stole the other day and thoroughly enjoy it. You do a very good job entertaining the kids and all that. You know, it, it's, well, it's a reward on uh, its own, you know, and it's, uh, it gives you a nice feeling. Hi, good morning, girls and boys. Now, this is Sheba. Now, Sheba's an Indian elephant or an Asian elephant, whichever you prefer to call them. Uh, Sheba weighs three tonnes in weight, she's 20 years of age, she stands about nine foot tall, and she's only a teenager as far as elephants go. Would you like to say good morning to her? Good morning, Sheba! Sheba, would you like to say good morning to the girls and boys? Hey, hey, come here, would you like to say good morning? Nice and loud. Hey, sing it nice and loud. Hey, say hello to say. Circuses are one of the forms of entertainment which have adapted as the world has changed around them. Their magic has survived all of this, and they battle rising costs with a determination to survive that too. If the Ridgeways have their way, for many years to come you'll still hear New Zealand children call, Here Comes the Circus.